right. Okay, so look, um, just firstly a little bit of a flashback as a scene setter. So um, back to 1999 when I actually joined this organisation and um, the state of our telecommunications market in those days. And um, we were pretty much literally at the bottom of the OECD league table by every telecommunications measure. Uh, we were actually 22nd equal out of 23 countries. Uh, the, um, our partner there was Mexico. Um, we had telecom recently privatised, uh, unregulated, and absolutely running uh, riot in defence of its monopoly uh, with some of the highest telecommunications prices in the world. And we had the mobile market um, with Bell South having failed dismally and uh, sold out to Vodafone who were just trying to get a foothold uh, against the, uh, the telecom strength. And that was before the days of number portability, so anyone who wanted to swap from telecom to Vodafone had to change their telephone number and that meant their business cards and their, their stationery and everything else. So it was a pretty bad situation. And in the 12 years I was around, two ends, we had pretty much a, um, a major battle every year. And they were all David and Goliath ones, and they were very, very bitterly fought. And even since I made that list up a, um, a week or so ago, I keep thinking of new ones. There was 0867, who remembers that? 0867 there, when um, uh, Telecom diverted all the incoming dial-up calls to a, um, a toll-free number and completely, completely munted the clear communications business model. Uh, there was mobile roaming when we commonly came back from overseas with a um, four-digit or even five-digit um, phone bill. So it was a pretty bad situation in those days. But I've been out of there now for um, eight years and I finished the therapy about a year ago and um, have kind of moved on. So today, um, this is um, what I'd like to talk about. I'd like to just go back to that uh, Nelson event. Um, look at what we've done well in 18 years. But I don't want to spend too much time looking at the good stuff because... If all we're going to do is congratulate ourselves, we might as well um, stand up, have a group hug and move straight to the networking drinks. Um, so instead I'm going to spend most of the time on four areas where I think there is substantial room for improvement in our um, making use of the really good world-class telecommunications environment that we're now lucky enough to have. So the um, National Broadband Applications Project was a, um, a three-day conference in Nelson at the Rutherford Hotel. I, was, I stayed there again quite recently. I don't think they've um, even really changed the wallpaper in the interim. The um, rather iconic building. But uh, somewhat to our surprise, we ended up with about 300 people at it. And a lot of that was due to the, um, uh, the personal charisma of the two ends president of the day, Judy Spate, who went around all the business organisations and um, charmed them into sending 15 or 20 people to a three-day conference where they could brainstorm what broadband could do for their sector. So we spent two days doing that, and we attached to each of those uh, sector groups a business journalist or a, t a communications journalist who uh, wrote up the proceedings and produced a book called um, Survival of the Fastest. Who's still got a copy of this today? Okay, Shane Hobson, Don Wallace. Who was at the, um, the Nelson conference? Gosh, okay, it's about seven or eight, nine, yeah. Probably a few more trying to get their wheelchairs up the, um, up the uh, stairs. Um, but it was an extraordinary event uh, with um, a lot of very really positive outcomes, and they're all in this book. We published thousands of copies of it. I know that we sent one to, the, to every school library in New Zealand, so um, I'm quite surprised now you know, just how many of them turn up in various places. So let's start with what we've done well, because we have done a lot of things uh, really well in my view. Um, firstly, the connectivity. Connectivity. We're getting really close um, to ubiquitous coverage, really quite close. And we've done that, uh, I think, because we have had political consensus generally around the importance of broadband in terms of economic and social development. We're way ahead of the Australians, as you'd expect. They have quite the reverse. They, um, broadband is a political hot potato across the ditch. Uh, here, both parties generally agree that it's a really important part of our future. Um, and two ends has played a role over the, uh, the last 20 or so years um, in creating that climate. Um, I'm not sure whether um, more um, uh, of the RBI in its present form is the right way to carry on. I think there's increasingly we're going to find wastage if we go down the track of um, sitting in an office in Auckland and working out where the next connection should be. 
And I think there's probably scope for something like a voucher system where the people who haven't got broadband but want it can self-identify uh, and can confirm that they don't already have coverage and I think we'll get a better outcome that way. But that's a personal opinion and that's an argument for another day. But generally speaking, um, we're trucking along pretty well there. And the Rugby World Cup may well be the way to finish the, uh, the job because there is going to be so much interest around that. fascinating thing about the Rugby World Cup is that if in the middle of one of those games the internet collapses, it'll bring down the government even though they've had absolutely nothing to do with it. Um, so um, it's, a, it's a very exciting development. I'm sure there are a few people in Spark having a, uh, losing a bit of sleep over it at the moment. Um, so who are the achievers though in terms of uh, the, the uses of broadband? So you've got to put the financial services sector out in front. I mean banking is completely transformed. Um, you know, everything is now automated. You start with the automated option. It's only when you get something really, really complicated that you need to get hold of a person. Education has raced ahead. And I've got huge admiration for the teachers all over New Zealand who've actually, in effect, self-taught their way into um, digital education. Now, there are some who haven't, some who really have difficulty making that transformation. Um, but um, there's been a lot of progress in that area, and I think our education sector deserves a lot of um, kudos for the way they've gone about that. Government services have generally gone pretty well, um, <coughs> and um, I deal with MB, um, I, and I find their site really, really good. I, dealing with inland revenue, it's almost a pleasure to pay your tax these days, because it is so easy, so straightforward, and I think most government and local government services are pretty much in that, um, in that category. I will, however, um, call out one major government agency that um, I, I thought about putting their, their logo up, but um, I thought it was a bit unkind. But just to give you a clue, they work in the area of accident compensation. Um, I've had dealings with them um, over recent years in two ways. Firstly, because as a small business, I pay a levy, and that's a big drama because they won't send it out electronically. And it is literally the only piece of mail that comes into my mailbox every year that I really need that I can't get online. So ACC refuses to email um, um, <coughs> uh, files for routine business because they're, they're too big. Now, I had a, an unfortunate mishap last year which brought me into contact with ACC. I was actually um, playing cards at my dining room table and I tore a ligament off my kneecap. Um, that's another story. But um, So I had more to do with them for a few months than I would have liked. One of the things I discovered is that they won't use email because the files are too big, so everything has to be mailed backwards and forwards. They won't um, talk to anyone who's driving, even if they're on a, um, uh, a Bluetooth connection. Um, they won't email invoices or make them available online. I asked one of them, could you email me this invoice? And they said no. And I said, well, why not? And they said, because if we did it for you, we'd have to do it for everyone. And I thought, hallelujah, you know, I wonder if they promote that person for that idea, but no. And interestingly, they, um, they request personal identity information. Now, um, I've had numerous calls from ACC at various times that have got a common theme. So I answer my phone and they say, is that Ernest? When anyone asks for me by the name of Ernest, I know it's someone I really don't want to talk to. Um, so I say yes, and they say, oh, it's, it's Flossie from ACC. Now, before I talk to you, I need to get your, uh, confirm your identity. Could you please tell me your mother's maiden name? So I say, well, actually, before I give you that, could you please give me your mother's maiden name? And they say, no, no, we want your, maiden, your mother's maiden name. So I say, no. I, so they say, well, why do you want that? And I say, well, you've rung me on a number that you've got on your file. My number's freely available on my website, the white pages, various other places. When I answered the phone, I gave you my name. So you've got a reasonable expectation. I'm who you think you want to talk to. But I, on the other hand, you've, you've rung me on an unlisted number you know, private number. You've only given me a first name, not a surname. I have no idea whether you're Flossie from ACC or an identity thief from, a thief from Estonia. So once again, please, can you give me your mother's maiden name? Now, from that point on, the conversation has taken in a number of different directions, none of which have been particularly productive. But I really find it appalling that a major government agency is so far behind the times that that's their practice on um, electronic communication. So I had to get that one off my chest. Sorry about that. Um, <coughs> fascinating. Oh. Okay, others that have done really well, tourism um, and aviation. 
Um, you know, Air New Zealand's been a great leader. An interesting thing about Air New Zealand and the great advances it's made um, is that it's a company, a relatively rare company, where the CIO has gone on to become the, uh, the CEO. And there must be a lesson for that in us. Um, retail bricks and mortar uh, retailers have been um, fairly mixed. Small business has also been a bit mixed. Um, the, uh, there's a lot, I think sometimes the small business issue is over-talked because a lot of, <coughs> a lot of people are uh, categorised in New Zealand as small businesses who really aren't. Um, you know, they may be contractors or farmers or drivers for trucking companies and whatever who show up in the stats as um, self-employed small businesses. Nevertheless, there is a lot of scope for improvement. And I always go back to an invoice I received um, shortly after I moved to Fokatani which and it's a few years old now, but I'm sure it's still the same. This is how a lot of tradespeople still operate. I mean, you go down a few lines there and you get um, um, screws, 50 cents. And you wonder about the amount of time that's gone into writing out that invoice. And more importantly, how much processing time has gone on in behind that to replenish that 50, 50 cent um, uh, bundle of screws. So we have got a lot of work to do in the, um, in the trades sector, at least. Not sure about um, small business more broadly. But as I said, I want to focus on four areas where I think we have a real opportunity for improvement. And the first one might surprise you because I'm going to call out agriculture. Now for developers, I think um, agricultural technology has been a real success story. And I was interested to hear Callaghan Innovation just last week talking about how we've become uh, one of the world's four key agri-tech locations. But I question just how well Kiwi farmers are actually responding to that. And there is obviously one uh, very current example on that. And um, are you able to play that audio clip for me, please? <laughs> this was the day after the um, M. Bovis announcement. ...in the town are not supporting the government's decision. Drinkers at the local pub were united in their opinion. This is absolutely ridiculous. It's the most <laughs> ridiculous decision made, and this is what happens when you've got idiots running the country that haven't got a clue what they're doing. Got one thing to say, if you've got an infected toe, you don't cut your whole bloody foot off. We feel it's very dark. We're lucky that we're in an industry <laughs> where we haven't got it, but we, we haven't got it around us <coughs> in the short term, but it will happen one day. So just a, um, a minor clarification on that, uh, actually it's quite common in medicine if you've got an infected toe to take the foot off in order to save the leg, um, but um, that may just be a matter of detail. But the reason I play that is that um, it seems to me to epitomise um, a sort of an anti-bureaucracy approach from some of our farmers, and when I look at the, um, the very unfortunate failure of the Nate scheme, and I know there are people coming along this afternoon with a lot more detailed information about that than I have, but it appears that Nate has really let us down, and it appears that um, farmers have let down Nate. What I read is that the stock agents and the sale yards are using Nate well, but it's the farmer-to-farmer -farmer transactions that are not being reported. And I've read a number of reasons for that, that the Nate scheme's a dog, it's too hard to work, the scanners are too expensive, the ear tags fall off. Um, but I also hear things like farmers just feel it's bureaucrats in Wellington trying to make work for them, which is kind of the attitude that came through from that audio clip. I also hear it said uh, that there is a, um, uh, a thriving underground economy in the, um, the movement of stock between farms which escapes the inland revenue net. But whatever it is, the Nate scheme should have helped us to avoid the M. Bovis outbreak and the billion dollars that all of us are putting into um, uh, to try to do that uh, eradication. And I think, you know, it's really good in this country that sometimes the city supports the, the uh, uh, rural, sometimes it's the other way around. But we, have, we in, as city people support the farmers with drought assistance, flood assistance, biosecurity assistance. But if you're getting money like that, then I feel there's a responsibility on the recipient to mitigate the risks. And I think um, Nate is an example where that hasn't been followed. So <laughs> my solution to that one, why is MPI not enforcing the law? It appears they've made only a token number of prosecutions. Farmers need to understand a bit better um, about the productivity and biosecurity benefits. Um, the guys out there on the land are not generally coming to conferences like this. Uh, we've got to get them more involved and committed. Um, and we need to um, uh, implement some other uses of the broadband that we're now getting increasingly out into rural New Zealand. And just as a nice segue into my next slide, rural mental health is a really good example of that. It's been a very hot topic for years, 
uh, and uh, the use of video can be a very good tool for getting farmers in touch with clinicians and other farmers and support groups and so on. So that brings me neatly into my second area of opportunity, which is health. Now, a lot of my work in the last eight years has focused on health um, in two different fields. Firstly, um, some of the consumer issues uh, arising from electronic personal health records. And then secondly, in what the sector calls telehealth, which is really just the use of video in uh, clinical consultations of one kind or another. So I've worked for um, three or four DHBs, uh, the Ministry, um, National Health Service in Samoa and various others on that sort of project. Um, what I see is a sector um, that is lagging decades behind anyone else in its customer interface. When we want to engage with the health system, we start with a GP. He's the, um, the most senior person in the, um, uh, in the practice and um, we start there and then we get delegated down uh, to whatever level uh, is appropriate to deal with, a nurse, a pharmacist or whatever. Everywhere else when you come to think of it, you start at the automated level and then you work up and if you really need to see a real person, you do. Uh, and so we're still really using the health system in the way in which we did in the 19th century, let alone the 20th. So there are lots and lots of pilots and uh, I go to a conference every year run by HINS, Health Informatics New Zealand, and I'm struck by the literally hundreds of pilots that are going on in various places and I've done a few of them. Trouble is all these pilots, they're, they're almost all successful running various forms of technology and health, but they're all tiny scale and once they succeed, nobody knows how to actually turn them into business as usual. And I think there are several causes for that. Firstly, I think there's a leadership vacuum in health. It's a tremendously complicated sector, but at the end of the day, the buck stops with the minister and the ministry. And I think successive ministers, and I'll leave David Clark out of this because I haven't really seen enough of him yet to judge, but certainly earlier ministers have been so preoccupied with keeping health off the front pages uh, that in fact they've um, stultified a debate that we really need to have about what we want our future health service to look like. Um, other, another is the lack of a sector vision. Uh, there is no, as far as I can see, no vision of what a 21st century uh, health system that takes advantage of all the technologies we now have at our disposal and that takes um, cognizance of the various demographic um, challenges we've got, uh, there is no vision that I can see for how that might end up. We have an incredibly convoluted structure, a mixture of public and private sector, money that is devolved by government through the Ministry of Health, through the DHBs, through the primary health organisations, out to general practice, They run, somewhere along the way there's some taken out to run the hospitals and the testing labs and whatever. So complicated, it's like a house of cards. Everyone is terrified of tinkering with it for fear of unintended consequences. Um, it's in a state of perpetual crisis management, um, <coughs> clinicians tend to speak on behalf of customers, and by the way we need to think of ourselves as health service customers, not as patients, because the word patients implies subservience to the, uh, the service provider. Um, and a sense of despair among good people in the sector. Earlier this year I was at a, um, a meeting with one of the, uh, the regional shared services companies at Health, um, <coughs> giving a consumer view on some of their prioritisation of some of their um, IT initiatives. One of them came up called Nurse Call, and I said, what's Nurse Call? And they said, oh, that's the button that you push on the, um, the bed in the hospital when you want to call the nurse. <coughs> so I said, well, hang on, you're saying we don't need any changes in that in the next 10 years. Wouldn't it be a hell of a good idea if that was replaced by an intercom or a telephone? They said, why? And I said, well, because then, you know, instead of the nurse seeing just a red light and she comes up, finds out whether you want a bedpan or a pain relief or a cup of coffee, you could tell her and she makes one trip instead of two. Wouldn't that save a tremendous amount of nurse time throughout the hospital system? They said, yeah, great idea. And I said, well, why don't we put something in the 10 year plan to get there? And there was a senior doctor sitting beside me and he said, it'll never happen. And I said, why on earth it makes real sense? That's how hotels operate. I mean, you don't have a push button in your hotel room. You have a telephone if you want room service. And he said, won't happen. And I said, why not? And he said, because we're run by the government. Now, in fact, in fact, that was a perfectly honest and sober assessment. There is a state of resignation and despair about meaningful change in the health system. Ministers and the ministry are so obsessed with stopping uh, the problems getting out into the public arena that nobody is actually doing anything to, um, to, to take up the digital opportunities or fix the core problem. So my solution to that, still have trouble with this. You'd think I'd have learnt some of this stuff by now. 
my solution. Firstly, re-engineer the, um, the whole system. Secondly, establish a consumer-led action group to actually work out what we want our health service to look like from the customer's point of view in the 21st century and then get everyone into alignment to get there. Uh, the, the opportunities, um, ageing at home with technology support, God help my kids if they put me into one of these blooming rest homes. I want to actually live in my own home, but I want the technology around me for house security, personal security, alarm systems, um, social inclusion, uh, health services online and so on and so forth. Uh, the use of video as an everyday com uh, communication tool, you know, they call it telehealth in the health system. That enables the opponents of it to make it sound slightly like witchcraft. Um, but um, it's just another everyday communication tool and it has a lot going for it. Uh, and a devolution of responsibilities down the stack. Specialists are very precious about devolving any responsibilities to nurses. Oh, they might bugger it up, you know, so... Um, and the nurses to the pharmacists and so on. We've actually got a, a diminishing force of clinicians in this country. They're ageing like the rest of us. And we've got to get better use out of the ones that we have. But nobody is looking at that, and there is a very fine line between clinical caution and patch protection. Put all those things together, and there is a solution that can change uh, health services making use of the technology. But nobody has pushed the starting button. <coughs> My third, of, third area out of the four is the digital divide. The digital divide for kids should be diminishing, but it's increasing daily. There's an increasing um, rich and poor pay gap. Uh, there's unaffordability of um, a digital education for kids in the low decile areas, uh, and um, there's a lack of government action to address any of that. Up in the Bay of Plenty, I'm on a, um, on a trust called Te Akatoitu, uh, that is involved with trying to get digital devices and connectivity into the, the kids in the decile one schools in places like um, Murapara and Kawarau. And um, it's a real mission to get the funding for this sort of thing, a real mission. And every day that we don't have those kids with a, um, a Google Chromebook or something equivalent and a home internet connection, they are getting further and further behind the kids at Auckland Grammar and uh, St Kent's um, who have all the, um, the, the um, trappings of the, uh, the richer cohort. Uh, but we've got to do something about that. So there's been a lot of really good work done. The 2020 Trust, um, which um, has been around since the late 90s, um, with its Computers and Homes program has done really well, but there's never enough money. And I see Claire Curran's coming along, and I hope somebody will ask her a question about whether she's going to increase the funding for that Computers and Homes program because it has done some amazing work. So my solution to that one is let the government be bold. They talk about digital inclusion. Let them put a target like, um, against that, like um, digital education for every student by 2020. That means three things, a device, the connectivity at home, uh, and teachers who are capable of um, making the most of it. My fourth and final one is around regional development. Location independent working is a reality. We all do that. We all go home and sadly um, get back on the work emails and do a lot of stuff from home now. Um, I'm able to um, um, manage a reasonably successful consulting business from the boondocks of the Bay of Plenty, even though I, um, I have to go out to Auckland and Wellington quite a bit just to network and because consulting, the trick in consulting is you have to walk in front of a potential client when they have A, a problem, and B, a budget. Um, you can do all the networking you like, but it's all about the, the happy coincidence of walking in front of someone who, who needs you at the right time. But we're missing the opportunity to rebalance New Zealand's population. <coughs> we need to decentralise government services. We need to um, uh, deal with the disparity in household incomes between the main centres and the regions. To me, in the Bay of Plenty, we talked about as having an unemployment problem. We don't have an unemployment problem, we have a low wage problem. Average household income in the Bay is about 85,000, Auckland I think is 105, Wellington's about 115. Um, that disparity is what is um, creating the poverty in the regions, not the, um, uh, not the lack of jobs. Um, and by doing that, if we can rebalance the population, we can uh, take the pressure off the housing and infrastructure crisis in Auckland. Hell of a lot easier to build a thousand houses in each of ten regional locations than build ten thousand in Auckland. We, need, we can also capture the, uh, the producti productivity benefit from the reduced downtime of people sitting in their cars all day, and we can have a better lifestyle because, trust me, regional New Zealand is the best place in the world to live, no matter what city or town it may be. So there's my solution to that one. Require every government agency 
to carve out a business unit of 200 to 500 staff and decentralise it to a regional centre within the current parliamentary term. And any further centralisation moves should be to regions, not main centres. So when the um, CEO comes up to the Minister and says, we want to um, uh, centralise this particular division, we're going to close down Ashburton, Blenheim and Gisborne and move it all to Wellington, the Minister says, good idea, but you can decentralise it all to Ashburton. Why not? I mean, we all live our lives online. We, um, we can use video conferencing at desktop. We've got all those facilities available. And then stand back and watch for those positive outcomes. So that's a summary of my recommendations that I'd like to see taken forward. So the question then becomes, who or what organisation should be responsible for, uh, for talking this up? And I go back to this, 2002. It was this organisation, Two Hands, it actually came out and, and promoted those opportunities from the digital era. And if there are some of those that are not being taken up, what better organisation than Two Hands to actually um, uh, start calling out the sectors and, um, uh, and working with them. Uh, and I'm very happy to be, uh, to be part of that if invited. So that's my assessment of where we're at. We are sitting on some really, really good opportunities that need a, a, someone to fire a starter's gun, preferably loaded. And I, look, uh, I give the challenge to Craig and um, the current two ANS team to do that. And I look forward to being invited back here in another 16 years to review the results. Thank you. <laughs>